Hello and welcome to the Tillage Edge with me, Michael Hennessy. This is your regular update for all your tillage news and advice. The rise and rise of fertilizer costs appears to be relentless and perhaps unsustainable. In a recent survey of tillage farmers, we found that the majority of tillage farmers have almost all of their fertilizer requirements either on farm or on order. Most of the purchased fertilizers are at a much higher price than 2021, but most farmers have avoided the last price hike, which was in the region of another 300 euros a tonne. On the other side of the equation, the grain price increase over the last number of weeks has compensated for the recent rise in fertilizer prices. However, the fact remains that it's still a high return of grain for every kilo of fertilizer applied, up to the point of the last 40 or 50 kilos where that return is a little bit lower. Any reduction of chemical fertilizer applied will be welcome on farms and almost every tillage farmer is trying very hard to source organic nitrogen in any form of slurry, farmyard manures or other organic materials. If these are applied correctly, then the levels of savings can be quite large. Both the type of organic manure and when it's applied will determine how much these manures can contribute to the growing crop. So today, to talk around this topic, I'm delighted to be joined by Tom Barry, who is farming near Mallow in Cork, and his advisor, Michael McCarty. Gentlemen, you're both very welcome to the podcast. Tom, can I come to you first? You might describe a little bit about your farm in terms of its farm size, your soil type, and the type of crops you have in your rotation. We have a number of different farms. We have, um, most of it is, is, is medium uh, loam free draining um, on limestone soils. We have other farms on that are sandstone and very sandy soils, but quite good. And we've one farm then uh, just west of Mallow that's a heavy clay soil. So we've um, we've a mixture of all soils. We've we've we're farming up to seven hundred acres roughly, and um, we're <clears throat> excuse me we're um, you know we're we we're just a rotation then of uh, we have winter barley, winter wheat, winter beans, spring oats, and spring barley. Um, that's great. And it, just in terms of to give listeners a, a, a bit of a view in terms of the um, how good you are, I suppose, really as much as anything else. In terms of your average yields, what are, are they fairly typical of what's what's staying around there, or, or what way would you see them? Well, look, I, I I don't want to measure up to anybody else. We just try and get uh, the best we can get. Um, what we do is <clears throat> our winter barley yields since we started um, uh, tackling compaction. And since we started using slurries, um, we're, we use all two-row barleys. Cassia was the first one of the really good varieties. We, we would be disappointed if we didn't get um, four and a half tonnes across the board. Um, we have hit yields of 4.7 and 4.8 year after year on continuous winter barleys. Um, other years, obviously, the dry year 2018, it was just 4.1. Um, but look, we try our best. I mean... You mightn't always succeed. We were on the plough and a till basis. So, um, you know, I did mental for a while, but it, it didn't quite work for me. Okay. Okay. Well, look, geez, they're, they're, they're phenomenally good yields, no matter where you be farming in the country. So, yeah. Now, that, that gives... our, 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 our spring barley yields then, last year now, we got 3.6, which was very good with gangway and our yields of winter beans. Uh, look, uh, they could vary anywhere from two tonnes, unfortunately, right up to four and a quarter. They're just a mystery crop, but we're we're if you look at the last number of years we've done and we're getting an average of three tons, which you know is pretty good. That is that is absolutely excellent. Yes, look, it gives everyone an idea of kind of where you are in terms of how you're farming. You mentioned organic manures, and I suppose this is really where we're chatting here today. Um, and you've been applying organic manures for the last number of years. How much land can you cover with that organic manures each year? And I suppose entwined in that kind of conversation is is how difficult are you finding it to source that every year sourcing it isn't isn't too bad because i work with one particular piggery and we're very lucky to have piggeries within 20 miles of us and um we spread we use about two million gallons every year uh, is that around nine thousand cubes and we we do most of the farms bar one or two places where you just physically can't get in the card you know because um, it's just not practical uh, with people's houses and all that. But we try and get as much as we can. It is it is difficult. Um, we have tanks in in one to three different farms, which is very handy reception tanks that we can put in lorries. Some of those are quite big. Uh, that really helps. So typically, if you have uh, a large tank carrying 160,000 gallons, you'll get a 50-acre plot done 
in a day. And that would be at 3,000 gallons. Um, we did that this year now. We, we then piped to another outside farm again, one and a half kilometres away, and we got 46 acres done with 4,000 gallons that day, which was pretty good per acre. And, and and Tom, just in terms of that slurry storage, is that um, do you have a sufficient slurry storage for what you're going to use in a year, or is it filled up at different times of the year? No, we just built a reception tank about 10 years ago. It's 100 feet long, 9 foot deep, 16 foot wide, well, 14 foot inside measurement. And what we do then is the piggeries fill into that when they have um, when they have time. And then once that's full, once we start once we start spreading, of course, the the, the cards and the, the contractors doing the umbilical card systems have been have really transformed this completely. We used to be going out with um, tankers and splash plates years ago. It was a waste of time. Well, it wasn't a waste of time, but it, it was desperate troublesome. You know, very very a lot of weather windows very short. Um, you also did damage to the field, whereas the umbilical card system with good professional operators is outstanding. So it's pig slurry you're using for the most part, is it? Pig slurry, 100%. Pig slurry. Um, I just want to bring Michael McCarthy in, who's your, your Chagas advisor. I want to bring, bring Michael in here just, just, just for a second. Um, Michael, you've obviously been working with Tom for, for, for a good number of years now and helping to get the most out of the, the, those organic manures. Typically, for the likes of the um, pig slurry, what sort of nutrients are coming from that? So we're looking at a very valuable source of NP and K, Michael, especially this year. Um, uh, if you look at the, the documentation there, that recently John McCutcheon and Mark Plunkett have come out with there, like they're saying that you know a thousand gallons of, of pig slurry is, is up anything up to nearly fifty euros worth, based on today's fertilizer costs. Interestingly enough, we did a, a hydrometer test on some of the slurry that Tom was getting in. in and it tested very well tested with about three percent dry matter um as opposed to the the four percent book value that we must use you know like sometimes peak stories can be as low as one and a half percent dry matter but tom's was three so we'd estimate that that per thousand gallons tom is getting about 14 units of n about five units of p and about 15 units of k okay and that's and that's readily available nutrients to the crop michael you know Okay. And in terms of applying that, uh, Michael, is it better to, uh, a lot of people, I suppose, end up applying those slurries in the autumn. Uh, is there, what sort of advantages is it in terms of putting in the autumn versus putting in the spring or is it the other way around? You want to put slurry on the ground when the, there's a crop there to use it. So like, there's no point putting slurry on a stubble in the autumn. Like you've, you've this very valuable source of manure so why would you put it on the stubble when there's nothing there to take it up? You know, um, it's it's a huge loss of nitrogen. It's 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 not good for the pocket. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for anyone. It makes far better sense to put this on uh, a crop that is that's ready to take it and ready to go. And if 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 you see the way Tom does it, it's 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 excellent because Tom is waiting for that as close to growth stage thirty as possible. You know. When the, when the high demand for nitrogen is in the crop. So in fairness, you know, he's doing everything in his power to, to utilise all those nutrients that are coming in, you know, and, and it's highly commendable on what Tom is doing. Right, and, and, and thinking, talking about utilisation, how much do you think or what sort of recovery do you, do you think or would you expect from the NP and K from that slurry that's been applied, Michael? If you're applying it, like, like, like Tom's applying slurry yesterday, okay, in, in, in good, good warm temperatures, you know, good growth, you should get, you should get almost get 100% recovery from, from that slurry um, in, in this sort of weather on, on a growing crop that is there ready to take it. Tom, I, I just want to come, come back to you. I am just listening to what Michael was saying there in terms of the recovery from P and K. And obviously you're taking that into account in the crops that you are growing. Um, in, in terms of the, the overall P and K, do you apply, if you like, bagged or chemical P and K to supplement the slurries or are you getting enough from the slurries in itself? I'm at this nearly 20 years now, not, not to the extent now, but you have to be careful because if you're growing large crops, hitting four and a half tons and also maybe three tons of straw, you're taking a massive load of, of, of nutrients out of your ground. 
And that's where the straw chopping comes into its own because it's putting back decay back into the ground as well. But what I would advise any farmer starting off this straight away, certainly in a year like this, you know, pull back your PKs a little bit. But the thing is, an awful lot of soils, you have to soil test, but a lot of tillage soils are index one and two, index two maybe. And the thing is that there, for until you build up the reserve in the soil after two or three years, it's then you start pulling back your bag, uh, P and K. Now, it's different for nitrogen. You can, you can start pulling back nitrogen, you know, on the crop in the year, but you have to be careful that you don't deplete yourself of P and Ks. And it's vital that if you are pulling back on your bags of P and K, that whoever has spread the slurry has applied it to the complete field. Because we often see situations where the chap up on the machine especially when there was no GPS, might miss a few acres here and there. And so that's, that's just a mess. And, and in terms of your own farm, then, are, are you relatively high then in, in, index, in your soil indexes for P and K, so you're not applying as much? Um, no, we're not, no. Um, we would have been back in the day when varieties weren't as good. We would, like you know, many years ago, you would have been pushing nearly 200 units of nitrogen to try and get a four-ton yield of winter barley. Uh, we're down at 160 units of nitrogen now and it's too much because last year the straw was very green and it took us a long time to, to get it baled. So we're going to pull the nitrogen back to 150 units this year, maybe less even, depending on, on how we view it. Uh, the P&Ks, um, I'm, pulling, I'm, I'm not applying any P&K except um, a small bit on a compound called 21 2.210. Um, because I'm conscious here, I'm taking off the straw. So I'm giving a small amount of, of P and K, but very minimal. Um, so yes, we're, we're, the stories are going to be providing the vast majority of our P and Ks. Okay. So you mentioned before as regards um, uh, how you're applying the slurries. And if I get you right, you are applying it through an umbilical cord system. So that's got a big pipe kind of going from, from one end of the field to the other. It's been pumped then from, from, from the top out, if you like. Correct. You might describe to me how, how that works, I, I suppose, really in a growing crop that I presume you're on, I don't know, 24, 28 meters. Uh, does that system allow it to be spread that weight or are you going between tram lines or how is it working? Well, in the early days, we used to just go with a splash plate up the tram line and down the middle. So you'd pick a field and you'd pick a gear that would bring you to the top of the field. And typically with, when we were doing that, the most we get out would be 1,400 to 1,500 gallons an acre. Um, with the dribble bar system, um, if you pick your timing right in your crop, uh, because they can get through so much acreage in a day, um, typically you can keep applying it up on the crop until you can, I, I just use a very simple measurement. If you can stand in the crop and the crop, the crop will recover without breaking, um, then you're fine to go. And you try and leave it as late as you can, GS30, even a bit further, so that the temperatures are warming up and you're picking every nutrient up. Uh, it's a challenge. With winter wheat, you have to be very vigilant because winter wheat will, will stand up fairly fast. And if you're too late in there, you'll break the crop. Um, but the, the, the whole thing here is if you have storage, um, a tank, and it probably should be grant aided because if you could get grant tanks in an area, you get so much work done so quickly in ideal conditions. And that's the secret to cutting out P and Ks. Let's face it. Okay, we're all talking about the price of P and Ks this year in nitrogen, but they also account for sixty to seventy percent of our total carbon emissions in tillage. So why not do two things at one time? Why not do be good for the environment and 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 be, have a better crop and also save yourself money? So so Tom, the, but the drill bar system is 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 it a twelve meter one or a twenty four meter one? And you're going up and down. How, how is no, that working? Just in the field. Uh, the, the ones the lads have now, they have a, tw- a 10 meter. Uh, so they, they, they will be going off the, the tram lines. Yesterday was such a fantastic day and we had a particularly long field that we just crossed the tram lines left to right. We didn't, we didn't go, go on them at all. Um, you'll do no damage. Okay, so you, you, won't, you won't see any wheelings and that then later on do you or anything, no? Not at all, not at all. Okay. I mean, I've gone, in, I've gone in in conditions where it was wet and a bit soft and the best thing I, I could say to people is just walk away and don't look. Um, it will recover. It just is hard to look at sometimes. But 
in weather like yesterday, sure, you, there was no problem at all. And today now they're working away and it's it's just fantastic. The crop is absolutely taking it up. And on top of that, there isn't a litre goes astray. So just in terms of, I think a lot of people might be very nervous uh, about going into a growing crop, but from your experience in wet or dry conditions, obviously dry is fine, but in wet conditions, it, 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 it grows itself out of, of that as long as you're at the right growth stage. Correct. I mean, you know, you have to be sensible, but I mean, if, if the tire marks are marking the ground, but it's, it's not doing any more damage and you're not doubling over, you'll get away fine. And, 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 and the rig, Tom, that, and that, is that using low ground pressure tires and all that kind of thing? Or is it, does right. it make a lot of difference? They're using 900 tires, which is very good at low ground pressure. Um, one thing you have to keep an eye out for the pipe is the pipe and it's pulling across the field might snag up a few stones. So when you finish a field, it's just good practice to drive the tram lines and just check is there any stone after popping up. Um, the other thing as well, now that's the application of stories to winter crops are completely different to spring crops. Um, we have found with spring crops that you, like we're doing it now today, and we're moving on to spring barley, we have that plowed, we'll disc ahead of the, the umbilical cord, they'll spread the slurry onto the lovely fresh disc ground, it will soak in immediately, and within probably a few hours, maybe two or three hours, we'll, have inco- we'll, we'll disc that again and we'll incorporate the slurry completely, and We'll still, we'll still add probably uh, 50 units of nitrogen uh, or, yeah, about that maybe. And, you know, that's between the slurries and we may or may not go into half a bag of can afterwards. But essentially, um, we're looking at 60 to 75 units of, nit- of, of bag nitrogen um, and slurry, which if you add up the slurry value, you're probably around 124 units of nitrogen in total, which is good. And that crop will definitely have the potential of three and a half tons. Okay. Michael, can I just bring you back in again here for a second? Um, Tom has been applying, as he said himself there, he's been applying slurry there for a long time, over 20 years. Would you expect a buildup of that, the, the organic reserves, if you like, obviously the P's and K's are going to build up, but in terms of the nitrogen, does that build up over time that is going to give it a little bit more back every year? It does absolutely, and I suppose it, it it can be very evident at 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 harvest time, Michael. You, you'd see summer Tom's crops at harvest time; the straw can be still quite green, which can be evidence that there is nitrogen release going on later in the season from the organic nitrogen that's built up in the soil. Um, it's hard to quantify in kilos how much you could cut back. You know, whether it's ten kilos, twenty, or thirty kilos, but there very much is. The, the, the more years you go on applying organic in the or, 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 organic nitrogen source, the more that's going to build up in the soil. And yes, over time you can afford to pull back. You can, you know, on the chemical nitrogen even more again. You know. Okay, and and, and Michael, just in terms of applying um, it's, uh, pig slurry, I suppose in particular has quite a bit of P, as you mentioned. There's five five kilos of pea and that. So you're putting quite a bit on each each year and you're bound to build indexes. Would that be the case in Tom's ground? And is there, if, if that is the case, is there a plan to kind of mitigate that over time? You can see from Tom's side results that they have been building, building the last couple of years. And where Tom is seeing himself now is that he's in the high index three, tipping into index four in places. Um, another thing that Tom does excellently is, is pH. More or less all Tom's pHs are, are, are at seven. Um, so there, there, there still is, is an allowance for pea. Um, it's amazing that to see the crops coming off because the crops are using the nutrients on the other side. Do you know what I mean? Um, like it may sound like there's a lot of, lot, 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 lot of stuff going on, but the crops are taking it off. And I suppose that, that is one thing that Tom is watching over the years is the off day. But, but yes, so over time you would expect to build like, and especially on the index, index ones and twos, like it's very hard to build P and K reserves with chemical fertilizer. You can do it with with, with organic organic manures. And and Michael, would you see as you're walking Tom's crops? Would you do you think his crops are more resilient to I suppose the changes in the weather and that kind of thing in comparison to maybe other clients' crops that you're seeing that are not getting the same level of organic manures? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I suppose 
you know, Stephen Kildare is always telling us that stress is a major factor with diseases, and especially diseases like Grand Malaria. You know, Tom's crops are healthy, and, you know, they stay healthy through the season. And I suppose that, that, that green, that stress-free crops, they don't tend to suffer as much from the likes of Rinko and Grand Malaria than other crops in the area might. Tom, just going back to you for a second, you mentioned, I suppose, already there a couple of bits and pieces around spring barley in terms of you mentioned nitrogen or how much less nitrogen you're putting on. In your, your, your typical winter wheat that you have in the system, people might, might recognize this, how much less nitrogen are you putting on in comparison, because of your organic, organic manures in comparison to what you normally would have put on? I, I treat, strangely enough, the winter wheat uh, fertilization the very same as the winter barley. Okay. Because <clears throat> the thing is, what we're finding with the high yielding winter barley is now they're actually up at the same level as the winter wheats. Last year, after the beans, we cut just slightly over five tons to the acre. Um, so we had a rotation from the beans and we did it at 160 units. And like what we're finding is that, you know, wheat always compensates by increasing bushel and, and that. But the barley is doing the same. Um, we're getting, like Michael said there, like I aim to have a crop that's looking almost blue-green at one stage. It's so fertile. And the slurry also provides a lot of micronutrients and trace elements, which I, I don't know what they are, but they're doing a bloody good job. And years ago, we used to be adding um, other chemicals, you know, liquid nitrogen on the head to winter barley to try and get that extra bit. No need for any of that now because... It's being provided. And, and interestingly enough, after many years of doing this, I see the tilt of the soil is, is turning lovely. You know, it's just like a lovely garden soil. It's rich in fertility. Loads of earthworms, really, really good, healthy soil. So, Tom, can I ask you then, in terms of you're, you're putting this on for, for a long time, you're probably saying by the sense that you're getting actually better at, at applying it and more accurate and all that kind of thing. Um, in terms of your experimentation, if you like, in your own farm, are you pushing the boundaries in terms of reducing your chemical nitrogen year on year to see what you can, if you like, get away with or what you can, you can be more comfortable in. Absolutely. I mean, we, every year without fail, I mean, look, the TAMS grants are very good for getting discards in and all the technology is helping, obviously. But we go in religiously after taking away the straw, we disc all the ground, we bring up every weed and we leave it there for quite a while. People will be going, oh my God, we have a green bridge here. We had a crop walk last year and there was an awful lot of greenery there. But what happens is you brave it out and then you spray it off after a few weeks and you've got every volunteer cereal, every weed, as you can imagine, gone, cleared. And that reduces the herbicide usage on your uh, following crops to the point that we're growing winter beans with absolutely no herbicide. Um, which is a huge saving. Um, I don't particularly like that chemical anyway. It's a dirty oak for the sprayer. And the we're trying to cut back. That's our herbicides. But we're also, if your crops are really healthy, um, why would you be going with, with a very high rate of, of chemical? There's no need. Um, so, you know, but I, I take Michael's advice and I take others and, you know, we all discuss it and it's not simple. Um, you know, that's the, the biggest problem we're having really is ready go to tar is missing and it's forcing us to set barley a little bit later. And unfortunately, last, last October was wet enough and we had a bit of um, damage from slugs and that's very disappointing. So ready go to tar is one that I'm, you know, I'm, I, I find is a challenge. Tom, could I bring you back actually just to talk about your nitrogen bit in terms of are you doing a bit of experimentation um in reducing your nitrogen, if you like, in the overall terms, because you're applying so much organic manures? Look, if fertilizer keeps being really dear, um, the obvious way to go if you've got limited supplies of nitrogen is to do spring barley, winter beans, spring oats. Because our winter crop, our spring barleys, will use virtually half the nitrogen a winter crop uses. You, you'd, you'd get away with 60 units of nitrogen if you had to on a spring crop with slurries. Um, but the problem is, you know, being the Irish environment and weather and all that, um, and also the yield potential of the high weeds after break crops, you, you want to spread your load and have some winter and some spring. Okay. And Tom, have you done a calculation on a year to year basis, how much of a saving 
you were making on chemical fertilizer or maybe overall in terms of fertilizer by using organic manures in comparison to using all um, chemical fertilizers? I suppose, yeah, look, we can make great savings this year because look, we're keeping our units nitrogen to 100, 240, 50 units in winter barleys. We're cutting out our P and Ks. Uh, the P and Ks alone, if you value them at 800 euros a ton, it's 40 euros a bag. Uh, that's 160 euros an acre saving straight away. Every bag of can you save, which we're definitely saving a bag and a half, is, is at, at 38 to 40 euros um, a bag. You're saving nearly 60 euros again. So you're saving definitely 200 euros an acre. But I did this before fertilizer got dear. And the reason why was our average yields in winter barley were slipping. We were three and a half. You could even be less than three and a half. You could three and a quarter. There's no doubt that by going the route of uh, good standing varieties, varieties that, are, that, are, that have a good strong stem, because you can't have a weak yoke that's going to fall, um, going with those varieties and adding, cutting out your compaction and keeping your, your tractors off the field and loading in the headlands and being sensible, um, we, were, we increased our yields by at least three quarters of a ton. And no matter what game you're in, it's all about yields getting more out of the same acre. And that's, that's what I said to people is, you know, do it right, get your yields up, but the benefits are multifold, including less cost. There were less costs even when fertilizer was 250 euros a ton. And you were saying there's 200 euros an acre in, in terms of saving uh, for chemical fertilizers, but that's obviously not all one way. It's costing you money to put that organic manure onto the field. How much do you eat into that 200 euros by, 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 by applying the organic manures? We do roughly 50 acres a day and 50 acres a day on give the give it a 10 hour day at at say 120 an hour or whatever that's 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 um that's 1200 euros you know so 1200 divided by 50 that's 24 euros an acre now if we but then when we have fields where we have to unload off the lorry they take us twice the time so they're up to 50 euros an acre. But okay. they still make value because if you're saving 200 and you're spending 50, I That's mean, a very, you're, it's, you're, it's a very easy calculation to do that one time. We, we, we don't need too many calculators to compare one yeah, versus the other there. It but, certainly but, makes sense. Absolutely. But you still have to go back to the fact that you'll be up a good half a ton in yield if you do your job properly. Yeah. Um, Michael, can I just bring you in finally? Just one, one last question. I'm going to come back to Tom then for one last question. Um, it sounds like uh, that Tom has this cracked. It sounds like a fantastic thing to do. Do you think many more of your clients can repeat what Tom is doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think especially since the TAMs, the, or sorry, the, the low emission slurry spreading TAMs, Michael, there's a lot more umbilical systems in areas now where there wasn't in the past. And some of these machines are very, very high tech, you know, with auto steer systems, flow meters, and everything. So, you know, nearly uh, a lot of the contractors that would have been into slurry have umbilical systems now. So, I don't think the, the excuse of I can't get access to an umbilical system really isn't there anymore. Sure. Um, and I would urge anyone that would be spreading a lot of organic manures, especially if they're spreading them in the autumn, to consider spreading them in the spring. Um, when the crop needs us, um, because it can be done, and, and Tom is proving that it can be done. It takes organisation, like like Tom Tom will tell you, it takes a lot of organisation to make sure things are running streamlined, you know. Uh, but it, it it certainly can be done, Michael. Okay, great, Tom. I want to ask the very final and give the final word to you. Um, obviously, you, you you've done a lot of sort of slurry spreading over the last twenty years, as you mentioned. Have you got all the infrastructure in place that you want in place in terms of tanks or pipes that are feed out to the field? And if not, do you see yourself spending a bit more money on, in that area? God, no, we don't have enough. I mean, it's a benefit when you take a farm that's got a tank already. Um, I mean, ideally, like when we, what the tank we work off of, our main tank, that has a radius to spread of, of 1.6 kilometers. So strategically, um, you know, that's what you're looking for is land, you know, within a, almost two kilometers of, of a tank. But to give us more flexibility, we should have twice the size of storage in our tanks. And, you know, 
it makes perfect sense that our neighbouring dairy farmers should be unloading into our tanks as opposed to having to build tanks themselves. And the department needs to come on board a bit more on this to allow transfer of, of slurries. And it's very easy, like Michael showed us yesterday, how to measure the slurries and the, and the nutrient values. And it, there's work to be done here. One last point as well is that, you know, like Mike said, it takes organisation. Like we had three lorries and we would love to have had four lorries and um, working yesterday and we had two guys in the spreader. So there should be some incentive for people uh, or for the piggeries or for the guys spreading to give them some grant to do it because people are weighing up. If they're not organised, it will cost them double and they're not really sure. So if there was some incentive to get people into it and to start doing it, once they're doing it, I, I, I would feel they, they will definitely stick with it. And also a point that's lost in some people is I was there yesterday we're, we're, and today now we're setting spring barley today. But at the same time, I have 50 acres of winter barley and, neut- um, you know, with uh, the fertilizer spread on it. So there's another job being done on my farm and the lads are tipping away at 50 acres a day in other fields while I'm doing work on this side. So I have exper- experienced personnel coming in and working on other fields. So our we're, we're really getting to our crops on time and it's good value. Tom, that's brilliant. It's been a, a fantastic and very enlightening um, uh, a few minutes that we've, we, we've had a chance to talk on this, on this really lovely day. And I, I do realise I'm probably keeping you from planting that spring barley. So I'm going to let you go at that. And Michael as well, thank you very much for joining me. I know you're kind of calling in from, from, from the car because I know you're out um, calling into lots of, of, um, of your clients there walking their crops. So again, thank you, thank you very much for your time. And I'm certainly going to let you back to your work as well. So be, be, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and uh, hopefully we'll catch up again soon. No doubt. Bye bye. Thanks, Michael. So that's all we've time for. And my thanks to Tom and Michael for joining me on the podcast today. As always, if you have a suggestion about a topic you want to hear more about, then drop me an email at michael.hennessy at chagas.ie or on Twitter at Chagas Crops. We always want to hear from farmers and people in the industry about what interests you, so please do get in touch. Finally, don't forget, if you enjoyed the podcast and recommend it to a friend or colleague, and as always, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify so you never miss an episode. And for more information, go to chagas.ie. I'm Michael Hennessy. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with more tillage news and advice.